morning, church. You can go have a seat. It's good to sing of the power of heaven. It's good to sing of the redemptive work of our Lord. Uh, we're going to be reading about that and studying that in our, in our scriptures today in Matthew. But before we get into that, a couple of questions for you to consider this morning. Do you ever have those moments uh, where you're just struck by the beauty and the grandeur of God's creation, right, of his plan, uh, and even of your place in it? Do you ever have those kind of moments? For me, they often come when I'm out uh, driving during the springtime and seeing all the beauty of the blooming flowers and trees, right, or out on a walk in nature. It's an opportunity to reflect. It's an opportunity to just be in awe. Or how about this? Maybe you're here this morning and you look around and, and what strikes you is the overwhelming just spiritual darkness in our world. You see the utter disregard that people have for one another, uh, the hatred that they appear to have, and, and you think, God, where are you in the midst of all of this? What are you doing right now? Regardless of where you might be at this morning as you come in here, both of those responses have the effect of driving us to someone greater than ourselves. They both call us to look beyond ourselves. They acknowledge that this world and everything that's going on in it, it's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. In the words of King David from Psalm 131, it's a reminder that there are uh, things that are too great and too wonderful for me. But, right, in that very same moment as we come to that realization, there ought to be a reminder that, there are, that there's a God who these things are not too great or too wonderful for. He understands. He has a plan. He is over it all. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is lost. Because God is moving. He's moving in his creation, and he's, he's moving all of human history towards this glorious completion of his kingdom. God has a grand plan of redemption that he is actively working out for the good of his kingdom people and for his glory. That's what we've been learning about in the Gospel of Matthew. And today, as we continue to, to study through Matthew, uh, we're going to see the further unveiling of this glorious plan of God's kingdom and his redemptiveness in that kingdom. Now, if you've been here through the years, uh, last year and this year, we've heard Jesus proclaim this kingdom, right? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. It's nearer than ever before. He, he's called the people to prepare themselves to get ready. Right? This is the long-awaited kingdom of the Jewish people. They're expecting the Messiah to come. They're expecting that the Jews will be the people of God, that they will be um, the one who, is, who are blessed, that this Messiah will establish God's rule and reign once and for all. But what we've seen and what we've heard through Matthew is that this scope of the kingdom is, is far greater than even the Jews understood. That it's actually uh, for the Jews and the Gentiles, the non-Jews. Jesus has come to redeem a people from, for himself, like Mark read earlier, um, from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. And it's faith in Jesus. That's the requirement to enter into that kingdom. Not your ethnicity, not your ancestry. Faith in Christ. Most of the Jews weren't real excited about that. Especially the religious leaders. We've seen that they are in the process of looking for ways to arrest Jesus and to kill him. But that's not slowing him down in the least. Jesus is on a mission. He's advancing the kingdom plan that he and the Father and the Spirit put together before time began. He's not going to let anything stop him or get in his way. God's rule and reign must be recognized across all of creation. And what we're going to read today is that the next stage of that plan, what's being unveiled, is very important. And it's really um, practical to us because it deals with the, the part of history where we are included in the plan. This has a direct impact for your life right here, right now. So go ahead and uh, grab your Bibles uh, or your smartphones, whatever you're using to read the Word this morning, and turn to Matthew chapter 16. That's page 479 of the Blue Bibles, if you grabbed one of those in the foyer on your way in. And today we're going to be reading in verses uh, 13 through 20. We're going to hear uh, just what, what Jesus has planned for the next stage of the kingdom of God. All right, you ready? Here we go. Here's God's word, starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, 
Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. All right, so what we just heard and what we're seeing is a, is a big transition here. Jesus is ending his ministry up north, above the Sea of Galilee, to the Gentiles. And he's, he's about to begin his southerly journey down to Jerusalem, where he knows right, what's waiting for him. The death on the cross and the resurrection from the tomb three days later. Every step of Jesus' ministry has been intentional and continues to be intentional. He came and he revealed himself first to the Jews but also then to the Gentiles. And he called all of them to repent and to believe in him. He taught them what it it meant to live as kingdom people. But as we've seen, many were unwilling to repent and believe. They wanted to keep living their own ways. And what we just heard here in verses 13 and 14, many don't get it. They don't understand who Jesus is. They, They don't see his true identity. And they, in fact, come up with all sorts of wrong conclusions about his identity. But out of the Jews, Jesus called 12 to follow him. These men became his disciples, who he trained up to carry on the work of the mission after he was gone, to continue advancing the kingdom. Now, throughout Jesus' ministry, we've seen the 12 kind of stumbling and bumbling their way through their understanding of who Jesus is in their own faith journey. They've been rebuked multiple times for having little faith, but they are learning. They are growing. They are following him. And what you hear today from Peter is a clear confession of Jesus' identity. It's a cry of faith. Now, Peter is often the, the leader or the spokesperson for the 12. And this is a high point in their growth as a group. For, for this moment, at least, they're seeing clearly They have a clarified understanding. And what's happening here between Peter and Jesus is is actually a life-changing historical moment, not just for Peter, for all of us. Its it's implications uh, ripple through history for all of us. It sets the stage for the advancement of God's kingdom plan. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss three life-changing realities of God's plan. Three life-changing realities of God's plan. You see, from the moment of Peter's uh, response, his confession, and then Jesus' response to him, nothing has been the same. Your life today has been radically impacted by how Peter responded in that moment and what God was doing in Peter, in the 12, and then through Christians throughout history. But it's not just a one-time thing that changes. It's an ongoing change. It's a life-changing change. Reality. So let's, let's go back to verses 13 through 17 here and see the first of these life-changing realities. It says again, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that, I, say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Right? They've got all these ideas. They don't know for sure. They're just tossing things out, what, who Jesus might be. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Right? There's the key. Who do you? That's plural. He's talking to the whole group. What's your response? What do you believe? What do you confess about me? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter gets it. He has that moment of divine clarity, and he identifies correctly who Jesus is. And Jesus says, blessed are you. 
right? He pronounces a blessing over Peter's declaration because God has revealed this to you, Peter. You didn't figure this out on your own. You didn't demand signs like the Pharisees were just a few moments ago. You have been, your eyes have been opened by my Father in heaven. This is God at work in Peter. Think about that. <laughs> that that's fascinating, right? Our faith, Peter's faith, comes from God. It finds its origin in God. It's his revelation. He, God, is the one who enables us to believe. He's the one who opens blind eyes and unlocks deaf ears and softens hard hearts. This is a very important thing to understand. You cannot reason your way to faith in Christ. God must first do a supernatural work in you. He calls you to himself. He gives you an understanding of the identity of his son so that you can respond in faith to him. And so this is our first life-changing reality of God's plan. The Father's revelation leads to confession. The Father's revelation leads to confession. Right? It starts with the Father. He is directly involved in the life of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl who chooses to trust in Jesus. It's his revelation, his divine disclosure that enables you to believe, to have faith. Listen to how Jesus explains this in the Gospel of John. He says in John 6, 44, No one can come to the Father, can't, or no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Right? No one. The Father must do the work. The Father must draw you to himself. Faith originates in the Father's work. He's the one who does it. Paul has something to say about this in his letter to the Ephesians. He says in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We're dead. Apart from God's work in us. Spiritually dead. In our sins. We're not looking for God. He comes to us. He's the one who gives us life. He calls us out of that deadness, out of that darkness into life through faith in Jesus Christ. It's by grace that we've been saved. You you must understand that. We must grasp this. God first works in you, calling you, making you spiritually alive, and you respond to his calling in faith. Hallelujah. (laughs) Praise the Lord. God cared enough about you and enough about me to do that work. When we were opposed to him, his enemies rejecting him, dead, not seeking him. That's how much he loves you. We were just singing about how great is your love. It's that great that he came after you. He sought you out. He didn't leave you dead in your sin. It's a humbling reality. He has done a great work of salvation in me. And in you, if your faith is in Christ, that's God's work in you. Do you ever stop and just think about that? To marvel that the creator of all things would care about you? Would take notice of you? Would have a plan from before eternity passed to rescue and redeem you? No one loves you like that or greater than that. That's how great his love is. It's God's kingdom plan to extend salvation to sinners by revealing his son to them. That's his plan. He reveals the son so that you can repent and believe. And that revelation comes from the father. And in this case, we see it leads Peter to a particular response. Right? He, confesses, he confesses his faith. Jesus, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. That's the first time that Peter identifies Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the one who is sent by God to uh, accomplish God's kingdom plan. He is the one who has come to set his people free from their sin, the one that all of Israel has been waiting on. Then Peter adds a little bit to it. He says, you're the son of the living God. He recognizes there's even more to you, Jesus, than, than, than what we were expecting. You're not just the Messiah. You are also... Have, you have this unique relationship with, with our God, with the creator God, with Yahweh, the one who really is and the one who's really with us. 
Now, he's still figuring out what that is exactly, but he knows that Jesus is unique. There's no one like him. He is engaged in this amazing way with God the Father. All right, this confession is the root of all true or orthodox faith, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the anointed one, the one who's come to save his people from their sins. Listen to how Peter later preaches the same message in the book of Acts. I'm going to take you through a few passages. In Acts chapter 4, here's what he tells a, a large crowd. He says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's faith in Christ. It's confessing Christ, who he is, that he is my Savior. Later in the book of Acts, now we hear Peter uh, sharing this with the Gentiles. So not just with the Jews, but to the Gentiles. He goes to a, the house of Cornelius. Here's what he says. To him, all the prophets bear witness, so he's speaking of Jesus, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Right Again, it's a, it's a confession of faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you're saved. It's through his name. And then a little bit later, uh, he stands up before the leadership of all of the church of Jerusalem, and he again repeats, belief in Jesus Christ is essential, not only for Jews, but also for Gentiles. In Acts 15, he says this, But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will, referring to the Gentiles. That's, that's how we're saved, confessing faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Final example comes from Acts chapter 16. Now you have the Philippian jailer crying out to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Do you remember what their response is? This comes from Acts 16. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. There it is. That confession of faith in Jesus Christ. We believe, Lord. We believe. In each of those cases, God has done a work. He's convicted the hearts of men and women to respond to the truth about Jesus. And that conviction leads to a confession. They profess faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is my only hope for salvation. Jesus would later say about himself in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? There's one way to God, and it's through Jesus Christ the son of the living God. There's no other way. So again, take some time to just reflect on that. Think about that. Chew on that. God's kingdom plan includes revealing his son so that we, sinners, right, could repent and believe in him so that we could have eternal life, being a part of that people of every tongue, every tribe, every nation, praising the Lord for all eternity. That's his plan. It's a beautiful plan. It's a grand plan of redemption, and you are invited to be a part of it. Right? (laughs) How do we respond to that? So just like, oh, cool. (laughs) Ho hum. On with my day. No, that's life changing. And so, uh, you know, when you think about the opportunity to make a confession of faith, I want to just walk you through what that might sound like. Lord, I realize that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And you are that savior. There's no other way. Please forgive me for my sins, for my rebellion. I want to renounce every other way, Lord. I can't earn my way. I'm not a good enough person to just get eternal life on my own. I can't buy my way into heaven. I confess it's only by your grace. It's only by your mercy that I have this hope. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. That's the beauty of confessing faith in Christ, of turning from any other way and recognizing there is one way. And that confession is life-changing. And not just for this life, it's eternity-changing for where you'll be for all eternity. Which is why, as the church, we are responsible for protecting this confession from anyone or anything that would seek to undermine it. Whether it's the addition of human works in order to be saved, or um, you know, seeking to say, well, no, anyone can be saved. All ways lead to God, right? Universalism. We have to protect against these lies, these perversions of the true gospel. 
Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Faith in him is the only way to God. So we want to protect others. Right? There's probably nothing more dangerous or foolish than trying to obscure or, or hide or add things to the way to God. We don't want to do that, and we don't want to see others do that because we know what the outcome is, eternal condemnation. And we love them enough to, to, to go after them and say, no, we don't want that for you. We want you to have the hope of heaven. Well, what happens next here in, in Matthew 16 is, is Jesus' response to Peter. Right? So Peter confesses faith. He's had this revelation from the Father, and he's now made this profound statement, and now Jesus responds to it. So let's look at verse 18 again. Jesus says this, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Peter declared who Jesus is, and now Jesus is declaring, Peter, here's, here's who you are. And he says to Peter, I will build my church on this rock. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. There's a lot happening in this one verse. So let's kind of unpack it, uh, bringing us to our second life-changing reality. The son promises to build his victorious church. The son promises to build his victorious church. So as we, as we walk through this verse, first thing you need to realize is, again, in the grand strategy of God's kingdom plan, he sent his son to build his church. That's a part of God's plan. That was a necessary part of his plan. The son always does what's pleasing to the father. He always obeys. And so uh, what that means for us is it's always been God's plan to build the church. The church is not plan B or C or D. The church is plan A. This is what God has wanted from eternity past. And so we see here Jesus' objective. Uh, one of his objectives in his lifetime here on earth is building the church. This is a significant like, next step in God's kingdom plan here in Matthew 16. Prior to this, the Jews think we're, we're the people of God and no one else. It's limited by ethnicity. Well, again, throughout his life and ministry, Jesus has been revealing God's plan has always been to create a people for himself of every tongue, every tribe, every nation, both Jews and non-Jews, the Gentiles. And now he's revealing this new united people of God is the church. It's the church. Now, the word church literally means assembly or called out ones. So these are the people that God has called to himself who assemble or, or gather together as the community of Christ followers, of God worshipers. That's what brings us together. We're his assembly. We're united by our shared faith in Jesus Christ. So that means you are a part of God's church if you confess faith in Jesus Christ. Again, just take a minute there. Think about that. You are a part of God's church if you confess faith in Jesus Christ. You're a part of his kingdom plan. You have been rescued and redeemed, and now you have been invited to be a part of his family. You are an adopted son or an adopted daughter of God, a co-heir with Christ. As God is working out his rule and reign over all of creation, you have the privilege of being a part of that. He's called you by faith in Christ. Again, tremendous reality, tremendous thing to reflect on and to be in awe of this morning. When Jesus says he builds his church on the rock, that's an interesting statement. What, what does that mean? Jesus, what are you talking about when you say you'll build your church on the rock? A lot of, a lot of ink has been spilled on that one over the centuries. The plain reading of this passage is that the rock is Simon Peter. Jesus gives Simon the nickname Peter, which means rock. And then very, very few words after that, right? He says, then this church, my church, will be built upon the rock. It's a wordplay for Peter's name, his nickname. And if it hadn't been for the abuse of the Roman Catholic Church, um, many would not have tried uh, to interpret this passage differently in the Reformation and other points of history. You see, the Catholics use this passage to argue for the, what's called the apostolic succession of the, of the priests, of the Pope, um, that from Peter on down through the ages, the Pope is the one true leader of the church. And they would still make that argument to this day. That's, that's how they believe they are the one true church of God, and the Pope is the one who has the authority of Jesus given to Peter. But that's a foreign concept to this passage. That's not found here. It's a foreign concept in the Bible at large. 
And when we understand that Peter is the rock, that does not affirm any of the Catholic Church's teachings. So, we see here the Bible is clear. Peter's the first disciple to make that profession of faith. He's the one who's making the clear, Jesus, you are the son of the living God. You're the Christ. And Jesus responds to that by saying, look, Peter, on you and through you, I'm going to build my church. But we find out that that's not just limited to Peter. Just two chapters later in Matthew 18, oh, wait, before we go to that, there's one I want to share with you. In his letter to the Ephesians, here's what Paul says about the church. In Ephesians 2.20, we read this. Built on the foundation, this is speaking about the church, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So when we're thinking about the church that Jesus is building, he himself, Jesus, is the cornerstone. He's the most important part of the foundation. And then all of the apostles and all of the prophets are also a part of that foundation. And if we read through the book of Acts, we'll see Peter is an important part of the local, local church. He's a prominent leader in the early church. But there are many other leaders as well. And so when Peter uh, needs to be rebuked, they're not afraid to rebuke him. Paul does that. The Jerusalem council holds him accountable. He's not infallible. Take a minute here. Just Again, gather your thoughts. There's a lot to think through in what we're talking about. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who rescues and redeems, the one who is trustworthy, faithful, and true, meaning he does not lie, he promises to build his victorious church. That's his promise. And that church is built on the foundation of of Jesus Christ and Peter and the apostles. And it actually is still being built to this day. We have the privilege of being a part of the church. Anyone who confesses Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is included in this building process. The next two verses in Ephesians 2 say this, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. If you're in Christ, he's talking about you. You are a part of the church that God is building, this assembly that he is calling out to be his people. And you're united with believers throughout history through your confession of faith in Jesus. You stand with with Peter, with Paul, with Cornelius, with the Philippian jailers, and and so much more. They are part of this body as well. You're united by faith with those individuals. That's a sweet thing to reflect on and to consider. Again, you are an adopted son or daughter of God, a co-heir with Christ. As you think about what you're facing on a a daily or even weekly basis, as you look around our world and you see uh, the turmoil, these truths give us hope in the midst of all of that. They center us in our faith and they help us to be able to be a blessing to those who are lost and hurting. We have a message of great hope to share and to take to the world. It's our place to rejoice. But it doesn't stop here. It gets even better. Jesus says at the end of verse 18, you are a part of the victorious church. Right? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What does that mean? I'm going to share a, a quick quote from D.A. Carson. I like how he explains it in his Expositor's Bible Commentary. He says this, The gates of Hades, or very similar expressions, are found in canonical literature, which means the Bible, Non-canonical Jewish literature, so things outside of the Bible, uh, and pagan literature, again, things outside of the Bible, this phrasing. And it seems to refer to death and dying. So as you study the use of this term uh, in all these different places, it has a common meaning, death and dying. And so the RSV translation translates it this way, the powers of death shall not prevail against it. Because the church is the assembly of the people of Jesus Messiah, right, the people that he's building, it cannot die. It cannot die. So this assembly, this people, this entity, the church, which you are a part of, remember, if you're in Christ, can't die. It won't fail. Nothing can stand against it. It will be victorious. God will accomplish his plan to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth and to make a people for himself of every tongue, tribe, and nation. And nothing can stand in its way. 
Right? So that, think about that. Again, the opposition by those Jewish religious leaders. Nope, not going to work. Not going to stop the church. The crucifixion of Jesus by the Romans. Not going to stop it. The persecution by Jews and Gentiles throughout the ages. Nope, God's church presses on. A court's decree in our day and age. Nope, can't lock up the church. Even our own sin, our own failures, our own shortcomings cannot stop the church. God's plan will be accomplished. How incredible is that? You get to be a part of it. It's not just something that God's doing and you get to watch from the sidelines. You are a part of that plan if your faith is in Jesus Christ. That's an amazing promise. But it also begs the question, well, what does that mean then for me, for you, to be a part of God's church? Well, look again at what Peter said, or what Jesus said next to Peter in verse 19. Jesus said this to him, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what we're, what we're seeing there is, is Jesus is handing over the keys of the kingdom to Peter. Now, keys are used to, to open doors and close doors, to, to grant access and to shut off access. If you think about that, what this means then is Peter has the power, the authority to exclude or to permit entrance into the kingdom of heaven. He can open the door for people to enter the kingdom of heaven. He can shut the door so people may not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa, right? I mean, what's going on there? What does that mean? Well, here's our third life-changing reality in God's plan. The son delegates his authority. The son delegates his authority. Jesus knows what's coming. He knows he's about to depart this world and return to the Father. He knows that the next step of the plan is to advance the church, build the church, right? the gospel assembly of believers. And so these believers, beginning with Peter, they're going to need some authority to accomplish God's plan. And Jesus delegates his authority to them, starting with Peter, but ultimately extending to the church at large. This is the reference now in Matthew 18 that I wanted to share with you earlier. Uh, Jesus begins uh, to speak not only to Peter, but to the whole uh, church, the whole group of, of disciples here. Matthew 18, 18. He says, truly I say to you, and that's a plural you. He's talking to the whole group now. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So it's not just Peter that has this authority. There's a broadening of who has the authority. It, it helps us understand Peter was just the representative of the church, of that group of believers. And what's happening here is the church is receiving kingdom authority from the Son to accomplish the mission. The church is receiving kingdom authority from the Son to accomplish the mission. That's God's plan. He wants his church to accomplish the mission of the Father. So, right, that's life, that should be life-changing for you. That means that you can't just be, again, on the sidelines. God's people are not a people who just twiddle their thumbs all day long and, and eat bonbons on the couch. Right? That's not our calling. That's not what you've been rescued out of darkness for. You've been rescued and redeemed into the people of God who goes into the world to make disciples of all nations. That's the mission of the church. That's the mission of our church. We exist to glorify God through the fulfillment of the Great Commission. That's the making disciples part in the spirit of the Great Commandment. The way that we do that is in love for the Father and for others. That's what we're called to do by Jesus himself. And the church collectively must use the keys of the kingdom to open the door to the kingdom. And the way that they do that is by proclaiming the gospel inviting people to repent and believe in Jesus. But they also must close the door of the kingdom to those who reject Jesus, who say, I want nothing to do with that. I don't believe in him. That's what the church is called to do. And if you're in Christ, you're a part of the church. The church's mission is your mission. Jesus' authority has been delegated to you as part of the church. Maybe a, a more modern illustration would help us kind of understand this a little better. Think back to when you were um, 14, 15, 16, and for the first time your parents hand you the keys to the car. Right? That's, a, that's a big moment right there in every, every teenager's life. There's a delegation of authority happening in that moment. 
your parents who own that car are saying, son or daughter, uh, we're giving you the opportunity to use this car, right? But then they have rules. <laughs> there's, there's expectations there. Don't, don't drive too fast. Come home at a reasonable hour. Don't be driving your friends around. Wear this five seat crash harness and helmet, right? <laughs> Whatever the other rules they gave you are. Oh, and pick up milk on the way home, please. <laughs> All right? Whatever those, those expectations are. But it's a delegated authority. You're able to use the car, but you gotta use it in the parameters that have been established for, for you by the real authority. Your parents. Now let's bring that back to the church. The church does not get to use the authority of God any way it wants. Right? God is the one who sets the parameters for how we use his authority. And Jesus says here that whatever they bind, whatever they loose on earth will have been bound or loosed in heaven. What that tells us is there's real ramifications to this. There, there's real ramifications to how we use our authority. But it must never be, and it can, can never be, we can't oppose God. We can't operate outside of his authority. We operate in line with God's authority. We bind or close the doors on those who reject Christ, and we loose or we open the doors on those who accept or confess Christ. That's our calling. That's what we're to do. That's a tremendous responsibility for every single one of us. As part of God's kingdom plan, you, not the person next to you, not the person sitting behind you or in front of you, you are to be a part of making disciples of all nations. That's our call to courageous evangelism that we say we're about as a church. And as you go, taking the word of God with you, you are to be making disciples, which means opening your mouth, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, calling people to repent and believe in him. And you're responsible for how you use your time, your talent, your treasures to accomplish that mission. Again, There's no option for us as Christians to sit on the sidelines and watch as others are playing in the the game, right, of going and making disciples. We're not called to just sit on our duff and eat those bonbons. We are called to be actively engaged in the mission, exercising the authority that Jesus has given us to make disciples. Now, that starts in our home. Maybe you have an unbelieving spouse or kids. Make disciples of them. Maybe you have extended family members who don't know Jesus. Share the gospel with them. Seek to make disciples of them. Maybe it's your neighbors who live right next door to you. You see them all the time as they go to check their mail, but what would it look like to make a disciple of them? How about your coworkers or your friends? Right? Who is God putting in your path that you can go and proclaim the hope of Jesus to? To give them the opportunity to confess and believe in Christ. That is the amazing kingdom plan that God has been working out for all time. And again, you have the immense privilege of being a part of it and of participating in it. Don't squander your call. Right? Don't squander it. 